Good morning. So I've been trying to get through my notes for three days. <laughs> Today I'm going to get through everything I plan to get through. As I said yesterday, there, when I was thinking about these talks, there were just so many things I wanted to address. And, and uh, I wanted to do like a whole semester's worth of talks. But, and I kept weeding things out, weeding things out, weeding things out. And, and, uh, and, the, and I stand up here and I keep weeding things out. Uh, and one of the things I, I haven't talked at all about is beauty, which is a huge omission. And I have no, uh, it's, a, it's a sad thing, we don't have time to do it, but there's, it would take so long to unpack, uh, first of all, to undo bad thinking about beauty that we've absorbed from our culture uh, and to, to, to reassert it. So uh, again, that's uh, a great uh, omission in the work. But I did decide I wanted to address what I think are the most fundamental theological concerns that uh, undergird a, cr a Christian thinking about and engaging, engagement with the arts, particularly to confront the various dualisms that uh, deter us from attending to uh, the imagination and to the works uh, 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 of imagination uh, in ways that we should. And so I talked about creation yesterday. I, I mentioned the incarnation. Today I'll try to get to incarnation and resurrection and I'll try to stick very closely to my notes uh, so, so that I don't deviate uh, too far and we'll get done uh, on time. The incarnation, it, uh, it, I, it's been interesting to me to see how the incarnation has grown in significance as a, a, a doctrinal center in my own thinking over the course of, of uh, I don't know, 30 years or so since I've been thinking more deliberately about theology and culture. And it's in part because I've begun to appreciate uh, the remarkable miracle of the incarnation more, more deeply. Uh, in part because uh, a Christian understanding of the Incarnation really does stand as a rebuke to the kinds of dualisms that, that I alluded to yesterday. And thus, the Incarnation is an important fact with consequences for our own assessment of the capacities of art. In the section of the letter to the Colossians that we read on Tuesday, and which Sandra uh, reminded us of in her prayer, the Apostle Paul asserts that by Christ all things are created in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, all things created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things find their coherence in Christ. The universe, all of creation is logocentric. Uh, it, it finds its order in Christ, its rationality, its logic, if you will. And in that same letter, Paul writes that in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, which is mind-blowing. I'm convinced when St. Paul says that the gospel is foolishness to the Greeks, it's as much the incarnation as it is the atonement that he has in mind. The most foolish thing is to imagine that, that the infinite God could somehow be fully present uh, in, in, a, in a single human being. So Paul in Colossians links the Christian understanding of creation as centered in the Logos, as ordered by the Logos, with the idea of the incarnation. Those are two doctrines that I think get neglected more than, more than they should. And it's the neglect of uh, the, the, the Logos tied to the creation and uh, the, 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 the full consequence of the Incarnation. I think it's the neglect that leads to our diminishing of the significance of life in the body, uh, generally, and uh, specifically the way imagination works through the senses, uh, more, more specifically. Theologian Colin Gunton has observed that the link between creation and Incarnation has consequences for our beliefs about the intelligibility and meaningfulness of creation. He writes, and this is a wonderful sentence, a world that owes its origin to a God who makes it with direct reference to one who was to become incarnate. I'll pause there. 
The world is created with direct reference to the one who was to become incarnate. To become part of that world is a world that is a proper place for human beings to use their senses, minds, and imaginations and to expect that they will not be wholly deceived in doing so. He's alluding there to the uh, idea, the ancient idea, that because the senses can be mistaken, uh, we shouldn't rely on the senses for any reliable knowledge of anything. And that suspicion becomes confirmed on steroids uh, in modernity, particularly with the work of Rene Descartes. Uh, Gunton is saying, if the world is created with the incarnation in view. If the world is logos-centered and the word becoming flesh is, 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 is a central reality, then we can uh, use our senses, our minds, and imaginations uh, without uh, expecting to be wholly deceived. We're not created in the image of a Unitarian and purely spiritual God. We're created in the image of the one who became flesh, who entered his own creation, who experienced it, who enjoyed it, who talked about it from the inside. We sometimes use the phrase God's eye view of things, meaning kind of way up in the sky looking down. A God's eye view of creation is a view from the manger. It's a view from atop a donkey. A God's eye view of creation is a view from a place at a table with sinners and tax collectors, from the top of a mountain and the surface of a dusty road, and from the crossbars of a Roman execution. That's a God's eye view of creation. It was not just a view of creation, but the sounds and the smells and the textures and the tastes of all of the particularities of the material world was experienced by a man living in a specific time and in a particular place in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwelled. In Jesus Christ, God experienced the world through human senses. That's kind of mind-blowing to me. And that's why the incarnation is so important to a Christian understanding of imagination. Because imagination begins in sensory perception. The incarnation doesn't just set an example for our making of concrete forms. It's often cited in that sense. But it also establishes a real continuity between us and God and the world that we inhabit. It's on the basis of that continuity, as Gunton informs us, that both reason and imagination can properly and confidently take up with the world, and that the knowledge we acquire about the world need not be pure geometry or just a logical sequence of abstractions to be valid knowledge. The work of Christ in redeeming us not only reverses our alienation from God, but because the work of redemption is accomplished by a man who in his resurrection and ascension is still a man, our salvation and our union with God doesn't require the repudiation of the physical realities of creation. If the whole fullness of the deity can dwell bodily in one man, then we can be assured that the material world is capable of mediating the meaning of supernatural realities to us. That's a very countercultural conviction that really flies in the face of, of most modern assumptions, even as it flew in the face of the assumptions uh, in the Greco-Roman world in which the gospel was first preached. The mediation of meaning of supernatural realities through the natural world is a work of the imagination and it's most richly achieved in works of art. So in affirming the incarnation and delighting in the reality of the incarnation, uh, we take an important step in reclaiming a confidence in the capacities of the imagination. The incarnation is a rebuke against Gnostic suspicion of the body. Early in its life, the church had to boldly affirm the full humanity of Jesus, especially the unvarnished fact of his bodily life against various teachers who were more at home with Manichaean dualism than they were with the idea that the word became flesh. 
And in some ways, it's really remarkable that the church fought back against that dualism. G.C. Burkauer, in his book on the person of Christ, observes that it's easy to imagine the church could have neglected the question of the humanity of Jesus while vigorously defending his deity. It would not have been surprising, he writes, if it had been content to establish that it was God himself who came to redeem us in Jesus Christ. The church has resisted this threat, however, and opposed docetism in whatever form, refined or unrefined, that it appeared. And you all know docetism, right? Or do you pronounce it docetism here in Texas? Uh, docetism, sorry. <laughs> it's been a long time since I was in seminary. The docet, I knew docetic, I knew the, the, the adjectival form of it with a long O. Docetism is the term we give to the, what may be the earliest form of that dualistic heresy. And it's a term you know from a Greek verb which means to seem, to appear, right? Because Jesus only seemed to be human. He only appeared to have a body. It's very interesting that the first major heresy and hence, the first concerted countercultural affirmation of the church had to do with the importance of Jesus' body. I find it interesting because of the fact that, in, again, in modern times, Christians and non Christians uh, are confused about the meaning of the body. The earliest account we have of this false teaching, and here I may be uh, re just reviewing something you had in a class. Uh, the earliest account we have, I think, is in the work of, of, of a man named Serinthus, uh, lived in the late first, early second century in Asia Minor. And Serinthus taught a very different framework of understanding who Jesus was. Serinthus believed that the world was not really created by God, but from some lesser power separate from God. He believed that Jesus was not born of a virgin, but the natural son of Joseph. And he believed that the man Jesus of Nazareth was an exceptionally wise and righteous person, but merely human. And that at, after the baptism of Jesus, the Christ descended from the supreme ruler in the form of a dove upon him and then proclaimed the Father God and performed miracles. So it's kind of like possession. Uh, an occupation of this man Jesus by the Christ at the time of the baptism. And that before the crucifixion, before things got ugly, Christ departs from Jesus, leaving him to suffer and die, but blessing him with resurrection as a mere human being for being such a faithful host, we could say. <laughs> the Christ being who he was, was incapable of participating in suffering. Now, Serenthus had been influenced by some of the same body of Greek ideas that shaped later Gnostic movements, possibly shaped by Manichaeanism, which is Persian origin. Uh, and Serenthus began teaching these ideas in churches throughout Asia Minor and developed quite a following around the time of 100 AD. We have some evidence that the apostle John wrote his gospel and his letters in large measure to combat this heresy. Um, Polycarp, an early martyr who was Bishop of Smyrna, knew the elderly apostle John when Polycarp was a young boy. And before Polycarp died, he told Irenaeus, a second century theologian, that John told him that he'd once been in a bathhouse in Ephesus with some friends. I love this story. And John heard that, <laughs> John heard that Serinthus was in the house. <laughs> Serinthus has not left the building. And Polycarp tells us that John said to his companions, let us flee lest the bathhouse collapse because Serinthus, the enemy of truth, is inside. I love the image of the Apostle John. <laughs> Quick, give me a towel. We've got to get out of here. <laughs> now that's taking theology seriously. There's internal evidence to confirm the claim that John was writing to combat docetism. 
In verse 14 of chapter 1 of John's Gospel, this dramatic assertion that the Word became flesh and lived for a while among us is exactly the sort of confident rebuttal that docetism would have occasioned. And in addition to the prologue to the Gospel, there are passages from the Johannine epistles that sound as if they were calculated to fight some form of docetism. For example, in the first chapter of the first Johannine epistle, we read, it's just remarkable language, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. How many times does he have to underscore this? We experienced it with our senses. We experienced life with our senses. Not the person who was telling us about life. He says we, were, we experienced life. We touched life. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The life was made manifest and we've seen it. The life that comes from God in our salvation was visible and audible and tangible in the body of Jesus, which is a pretty high view of the capacity of the senses. And then in chapter 4, we read this, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you, all, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. You know, we've all read books about people trying to, to deduce who the Antichrist is based on some alphanumeric code or something. Uh, John's pretty clear. If they deny that Jesus came in the flesh, if they have a low view of the body, if they're docetic or Gnostic, they're anti-Christian. That conviction about the importance of confessing the embodied reality of the Savior is also echoed in 2 John 7. And then finally, in the fifth chapter of the first epistle, we read this curious passage. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And some commentators argue that the water and the blood refer here to the baptism and the crucifixion. That Jesus Christ experienced both. He didn't just show up at the baptism and then get out of Dodge before the, the cross. He experienced the water and the blood. And so that may be, it seems to me to be a plausible interpretation given John's concern uh, for, uh, this, uh, for rebutting this docetic heresy. Now later Gnostic heretics were also offended by the idea that the second person of the Trinity could take fully human and embodied form. Uh, Va Valentinus, uh, Second century Gnostic was offended by the idea that the Savior might have endured all the messiness of pregnancy and childbirth. This is signal, uh, singled out uh, quite frequently among Gnostics, the idea that he went through all that icky stuff to be born. Uh, so he spoke of Christ passing through the Virgin Mary as through a canal. Valentinus didn't want Jesus to have a belly button. <laughs> Just, we can't deal with that. And Christ is credited with a body, but one that was non-terrestrial, effectively. Uh, it was by his unremitting self-denial in all things that Jesus attained to Godship. This is Valentinus. He ate and drank in a peculiar manner, without any waste. <laughs> Not only no belly button, but no large intestine. <laughs> The power of continence was so great in him that his food did not decay in him. For he himself was without decay. Valentinus' uh, contemporary Marcion likewise denied that Jesus had been a true man. The authentic Christ uh, 
could not have assumed a material body that participated in the created world as we did, for such a body would have been, and here's his concern, it would have been stuffed with excrement. We can't have that. It's interesting, you know, Freudians would have a field day with this, uh, with, with this problem. Marcin insisted that if Jesus had become a man with a material body, that that would have meant the end of his divinity. So you see how, and, and uh, this is a, this is a big problem that the church has to face early on, and suspicion of all of the messiness of embodiment. Yaroslav Pelikan, the magisterial church historian, has summarized Marcion's teaching on this. Pelican writes, human nature or the condition of having a material body and participating in the change and suffering of the creation was that from which man had to be delivered, not that by which he would be delivered. It bound man to this world and to the creator, and creator here is referring, Marcion affirmed uh, the existence of two gods. There's a creator God. There's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, basically. There's a creator God who made everything, and he's defective and deficient because he's involved with matter. And then there's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the good God, and, and the pure God, who, because he doesn't have anything to do with the material world. Um, so, involvement with the world of creation bound man to this world and to the creator, but Christ came from the true God and therefore could not have been born of a woman. He was revealed full grown at once. His body was like the bodies assumed by the angels of the creator when they met with Abraham and Lot, ate and worked. Now it's interesting to note that Pelican points out that the separation of spirit from flesh and redemption from creation is linked with a stark separation of law and gospel in Marcion's work. In fact, that's a point first made by Tertullian, who was one of Marcion's great enemies. Marcion taught that, in Pelican's words, this inexpressible and incomparable wonder of salvation was so overwhelming that it obscured all else in the world. Not only in the world is the kingdom of the devil, but in the world is the creation of God. The salvation of man was a more urgent cause than any other and transcends all others in its importance. It was the key to the proper understanding of other doctrinal issues, such as the resurrection of the body, which had to be interpreted in a manner consistent with the centrality of deliverance. That is, the resurrection of the body really had to be changed to the salvation of the soul. For, according to Marcin, it was the purpose of the coming of Jesus to abolish all of the works belonging to this world and to its creator. Sun and moon, constellations and stars, all were overshadowed by his coming. When he came, he did not come into that which was his own, but into that which was alien to him. The natural world was made up of beggarly elements, among which Marcin especially included reptiles and insects. I find this fascinating little detail. Particularly repulsive to him was the unclean, uncleanliness of sex and of childbirth, none of which could have anything to do with the salvation of man. Now, of course, the New Testament is not at all apologetic about the reality of Jesus' body. B.B. Warfield, in his classic study, The Person and Work of Christ, comments on the fact that the Apostle John goes out of his way in the Gospel's prologue to emphasize the most human of Jesus' human attributes. That is, he became flesh. Warfield comments, quote, that is to say he entered upon a mode of existence in which the experiences that belong to human beings would also be his. The dependence, the weakness which constitute the very idea of flesh in contrast with God would now enter into his personal experience. And it is precisely because these are the connotations of the term flesh that John chooses that term here instead of a more simple denotative term, man. He could have used a less metaphysically incorrect term. Uh, but he chose very deliberately to use the term flesh. What he means is merely that the eternal God became man, but he elects to say this in the language which throws best up to view what it is to become man, and it must include that. I was, uh, years ago, when, when I first started thinking about the significance of the incarnation really deliberately, I was speaking at a Christian college and chapel, big, everybody, all the students there, and I asked them, how many of you believe Jesus is still human? 
And most of the kids' hands went up. And I said, how many of you believe Jesus still has a body? And none of the hands went up until the president of the school put up his hand and then all the kids <laughs> put up their hands. <laughs> Obviously a firm conviction that they have there. Try that sometime in the churches you minister in. How many of you believe Jesus still has a body? And there's a wonderful, uh, if you're not sure of this yourself, uh, there's a wonderful essay that uh, J.I. Packer wrote some time ago in Christianity Today. I think you can find it online. I think it's called Incarnate Forever. And it's a wonderful summary of, of why the continuing reality of the incarnation uh, is, is such an important, uh, important truth for us and actually a very comforting truth for us. Uh, wh when I lecture on this, I, I often quote, there are some wonderful 19th century hymns on the ascension, uh, which include lines like, God with man is on the throne, uh, that, that affirm very confidently the reality of the continuance of the perpetual continuance of the incarnation. The English poet Brian, he Brian Wren uh, wrote a hymn about the incarnation called Good is the Flesh. And I want to read a few stanzas of that poem. And, and you can test yourself, see if you have any lingering Gnostic reactions to what he's affirming here. You can talk, talk to one of your professors afterwards. Good is the flesh that the word has become. Good is the birthing, the milk in the breast. Good is the feeding, caressing, and rest. Good is the body for knowing the world. Good is the flesh that the word has become. Good is the body for knowing the world, sensing the sunlight, the tug of the ground, feeling, perceiving within and around. Good is the body from cradle to grave. Good is the flesh that the word has become. Good is the body from cradle to grave, growing and aging, arousing, impaired, happy in clothing or lovingly bared. Good is the pleasure of God in our flesh. Good is the flesh that the word has become. Good is the pleasure of God in our flesh, longing in all as in Jesus to dwell, glad of embracing and tasting and smell. Good is the body for good and for God. Good is the flesh that the word has become. I first heard that, actually heard it sung uh, in a remarkable uh, musical setting. A friend of mine, Jack Redford, is a composer who has written a Christmas oratorio called Welcome All Wonders. And one of the movements is this, this uh, poem by Brian Wren. I would recommend Welcome All Wonders, a wonderful celebration of the incarnation. Um, now, once the church following out implications of biblical teaching formally repudiated Gnosticism. It did not eliminate the tendency or the temptation toward, toward Gnostic affections among believers. Nervousness about the body and the marginalizing the importance of embodied action has been a tendency for the whole of the church's history. Even when the church has formally affirmed the incarnation, suspicion about the material world which takes the form of an assumption that the spirit is only the important thing and that matter is a problem that we have to put up with until Jesus returns. That has seeped into the church's life from pagan ideas. One of the things that makes Christian belief so distinctive is, is this belief in the goodness of the material world. For centuries, it's been common for Christians to believe that despising the material aspects of life is a form of super spirituality. I would argue that it's in fact a very worldly position and it's not at all in keeping with the view of human life that's presented to us in scripture. In 1988, Nigel Cameron, a uh, British theologian who has written a lot on bioethics, wrote a book called Are Christians Human? An Exploration of True Spirituality. And the book was essentially a rebuke of the Gnosticizing tendency among evangelical Christians. And the book's first chapter is The Challenge of the Incarnation. And in that chapter, Cameron observes that evangelical Protestants have failed to give the amount of attention that they should to the humanity of Jesus. And he argues that this is in part because the, evangelical th the, the agenda for evangelical theological reflection, 
both academic and popular, tends to be shaped by apologetics. That is, what do we have to argue against? And since secularists and liberals deny the deity of Christ, that's what evangelicals have put a lot of energy into defending and reflecting on. Oh, oh, that someone would deny the humanity of Jesus and we could get down to business and have lots of wonderful books on, on the humanity of Jesus. Liberals have never denied the humanity of Jesus, so evangelicals didn't bother thinking about it very much. That's a little bit of an overstatement, but not entirely. A lot of 19th and 20th century apologetics and theology was shaped by the necessity of combating the fashionable view of what B.B. Warfield called a de-supernaturalized Jesus. Liberal theology wanted to explain the gospel in more rationalistic and naturalistic terms. So defenders of orthodoxy went out of their way emphasizing the deity of Christ, not at the expense of his humanity, as was the case in some of those early Christological heresies, but at the expense of very much reflection about his humanity. But it's not just because of apologetic imbalance that the humanity of Jesus has been ignored. There's still that deep suspicion about the goodness of embodied existence that has affected the church since the beginning. F.F. F. Bruce, great New Testament scholar, tells of an experience during his evangelical upbringing in Scotland in the Open Brethren Church. Uh, and he tells this experience, which was all too typical of many strains of Christian piety. He writes, in my youth, I remember the holy horror expressed by a ministering brother because someone else had in an address taken for granted that our Lord in his boyhood went to school. The very idea that he should have had to learn his letters from a human teacher was judged an intolerable aspersion on his perfect knowledge. He owed nothing to earth, said the speaker. As I listened to him, I felt glad that Luke stated expressly that Jesus increased in wisdom as well as in stature. <laughs> For I suspected that if one of our own contemporaries had made such a statement on his own initiative, the speaker would have been horrified at him too. Our Lord's deity is not enhanced when men, thinking to do him honor, detract from the completeness of his manhood. And as Bruce insists later in this essay, which was originally an address uh, on, on the humanity of Jesus, he says, the gospel of our salvation depends upon the genuineness of our Lord's humanity. And so does the value of his life as an example for his people to follow. The power of that example is weakened if we can say, in extenuation of our own failure, well, it was different or easier for him. Only as he presents himself to us as perfect man can we in turn be validly encouraged to grow up, not only individually but corporately, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The humanity of Christ has profound implications for how we understand both the accomplishment and the significance of the work of Christ. It is the obedience of a real human being, it is the death of a real human being, the raising from the dead of a real human being that accomplishes our salvation. It is the living example of a sinless human being that establishes a model for our lives now. It's the intercession of a glorified human being that is a source of spiritual power as we struggle in our own lives. And it's the promise of the return of the God-man Jesus who will come back as a full human being. Uh, that is the blessed hope for the fulfillment of all things. Uh, one of my favorite Advent hymns is uh, uh, Lo, He Comes in Clouds Descending, which I would encourage you to review the, the text. But uh, uh, one of the most powerful verses in that, those dear tokens of his passion still his dazzling body bears. Uh, and, and I'd sung that. And there are other hymns that talk about the, 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 the the reality of, of the, 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 the scars in the life of, uh, on the, in the body of Jesus that I kind of ignored. It's easy to ignore those things and not, not think about the consequence, again, of the continuance of the incarnation. The incarnation is not just the practical prerequisite of the atonement. It helps to define what the atonement accomplishes. It is our redemption as men and women, not as apprentice angels. 
that is accomplished by Jesus. It is as embodied men and women that we acquire, oops, I've lost my page, our knowledge of the world and of God through sensory experience, tasting honey, seeing the glory in the skies. Contrary to assumptions of modern philosophers, some of whom sound a lot like Valentinus, it is as fully embodied human beings that we know reality. Our minds cannot function without our bodies. And not just that part of our body that is the brain, but the life of the senses that conveys to us a matrix of meaning. I recently found a quote from uh, Rene Descartes, 17th century father of modern philosophy that confirms this stark entrenched dualism that has shaped so much of modern philosophy and modern culture. Absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking being. And then later in that same passage, absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature, oh, excuse me, it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. It is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. I've, I've heard people say that, that we're, there were not simply uh, uh, souls with bodies. We're not just embodied spirits. In terms of the chronology of the account of creation, we are in spirited bodies. The bodies are made first and then God breathes life into them. Fortunately, modern Gnosticism is being uh, confronted by many Christian theologians and philosophers as well as by Christian thinkers in other disciplines and even oddly enough being challenged by various non-Christian thinkers whose work has, a fruitful, have, has uh, fruitful uh, resources for uh, Christians to appropriate. James K.A. Smith's recent book, Imagining the Kingdom, which picks up on uh, his, uh, kind of continues the arguments he was making in his earlier book, Desiring the Kingdom, relies on uh, some of the work of philosopher Mark Johnson. And for years, Johnson has challenged the Cartesian assumption that we know the world apart from the experience of our bodies. In the first chapter of his book, The Meaning of the Body, which should be, the, I mean, it sounds like it could be a really good book on theology. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a book on the nature of meaning, actually. Johnson writes this, meaning grows from our visceral connections to life and the bodily conditions of life. We are born into the world as creatures of the flesh, and it is through our bodily perceptions, movements, emotions, and feelings that meaning becomes possible and takes the form it does. From the day we are brought kicking and screaming into the world, what and how anything is meaningful to us is shaped by our specific form of incarnation. Uh, Johnson co-wrote a book years ago called Metaphors We Live By, which uh, with uh, George Lakoff, I think was the name of the co-author, which deals with how many metaphors almost all metaphoric speech, which includes a lot of speech, is tied to the experience of our bodies in space and time. I met years ago a woman who was involved with the uh, artificial intelligence research at MIT. She was in the robotics lab. And uh, I, I was talking to her about some of the work she was doing and then subsequently have read articles about their work. And they found out that um, they're trying to build these expert systems that would approximate human knowing as closely as they could. And they found out that, that the computers they were programming to know the world as much like a human being as possible worked a lot better if they put them in bodies somehow. That they actually put, put them into mechanisms that, could, that were mobile. And they actually acquired an understanding of things better because of the fact that they knew in a virtual, well, a, a real embodied, I mean, there were metal bodies. There's a huge amount of, of, of scientific research that confirms the absolute uh, necessity of embodied knowing. So we're very, very grateful that we do believe in the resurrection of the body and not just in the immortality of the soul, that our embodiment is essential to our humanity.
Johnson's research in the meaning of the body is very reminiscent of observations by C.S. Lewis that I mentioned yesterday, that imagination conveys meaning by finding in our embodied sensory experience patterns and connections and likenesses. I recently read an essay on Christian imagination by a philosopher named D.C. Schindler. And he said, the imagination is, if not the center of the human being, then nevertheless that which out with, without which there can be no center. For the imagination marks the point of convergence at which the body and soul meet. It is the place where faith in the incarnate God becomes itself incarnate and therefore truly becomes faith. It is where reason becomes concrete and the bodily life of the senses rises to meet the spirit. It lies more deeply than the sphere of our discrete thoughts and choices because it is the ordered space within which we, in fact, think and choose. Again, I would really encourage you to, uh, to look at J. K., uh, James K. A. Smith's, particularly Imagining the Kingdom, where he develops, uh, develops this uh, in terms of uh, the, the function of, uh, particularly the function of Christian practices in our lives uh, to, 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 uh, to, convey, uh, to convey theological truths to us. The incarnation is the ultimate warrant for our use of the Im imagination. Almost ultimate, because I think the resurrection is an even fuller confirmation of the value and the virtue of imaginative life. The resurrection is a demonstration that God hasn't given up on materiality. The resurrection affirms that the incarnation is never over. The resurrection confirms God's redemption of his creatures, not by their escaping physicality, but by having the possibilities of physicality fulfilled. The resurrection has often been treated by theologians and laymen alike just as an assuring epilogue to the crucifixion. The work of redemption is accomplished on the cross at the moment of Christ's expiration, and then the resurrection occurs to demonstrate God's hand in the entire sequence of events, or just as proof of Christ's deity. But what if the resurrection is not an epilogue, but it's the climax of the accomplishment of redemption, and it's the prologue to the fulfillment of God's subsequent redeeming purposes? In Paul's teaching on the work of Christ, this is exactly how it's portrayed. One of my teachers at Westminster, uh, Paul, uh, Richard Gaffin, in his book on uh, the centrality of the resurrection in Paul's teaching, has pointed out that in Paul, the resurrection is not principally a proof of Christ's deity. Gaffin says Christ's resurrection is not evidential with respect to his divinity, but transforming with respect to his humanity. Paul depicts Christ's resurrection as a passive matter. It is the Father who raises the Son from the dead. In his resurrection, Jesus is viewed as entirely passive. It is, strictly speaking, not a rising, but a being raised. And Gaffin says that this matters because it links Christ's experience with our own. This uniform stress on the passivity and solidarity with believers in the experience of resurrection points to the conclusion that the significance of Christ's resurrection does not lie where the differences between him uh, and believers is most pronounced, but in what they have in common, that we are men and women, that we are human, that we have bodies. So Christ's resurrection is very much about our destiny, not just about Christ's identity. And not just our destiny, but the destiny of all creation. The resurrection is a sign that God's redemptive work isn't just spiritual, not only are sins forgiven, but life, the life of the world, is restored. Theologian Michael Williams has written that the deity of ancient Gnosticism was powerless to do anything but rescue the occasional soul from the corruption of a damned and damning material creation, scrapping the world because it was so ravaged by sin that it was beyond re rehabilitation. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it was declared once for all and for all to see that Yahweh is the sovereign one. And sovereignty means just this, God wins. As Isaac Watts expressed in his famous Christian hymn, Joy to the World, the grace of God in Jesus Christ extends far as the curse is found. God wins. And our creative engagement with creation, our life in the body in anticipation of our resurrection bodies is confirmed in Christ's own resurrection.
Now, I think that has profound consequences for a Christian affirmation of the arts in particular and for the broader cultivation of the imagination in general. The victory secured by the resurrection means that it is a fruitful and obedient vocation to encourage healthy and rich imaginations, which involve engagement with the material stuff of the world. The antidote to vain imagination is not the suppression of imagination, but the cultivation of a well-developed imagination. I can think of no better way to end these talks than by citing a great prophet of the imagination, George MacDonald. You may remember C.S. Lewis once said that George MacDonald sanctified or baptized his imagination. MacDonald summarized his case for rightly trained imaginations in a very dramatic exhortation. I'll close with this. Seek not that your sons and your daughters should not see visions, should not see dream dreams. Seek that they should see true visions, that they should dream noble dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we're going to uh, do a brief preview of what's coming up this uh, next week. Hang on just a second, Ken. I want to hang, out. hang on just a second. Um, Tuesday, prayer chapel. Wednesday, Dr. Ralston, who is on sabbatical, will be back with us. He'll be here in chapel. You won't want to miss that. On Thursday, uh, World Focus, and then on Friday, Mr. Tim Euler. Uh, as a review, don't forget, outside here we have the People's Choice Award that you can sign up for, if you, uh, that you can vote for, so don't forget to do that. And tomorrow, this is the last of, of uh, Ken's talks, but tomorrow you get to ask questions. We'll be up here on a couple of stools. Write them down. Think them through ahead of time. Write them down so that when you come to the mic, you can articulate them as well as the answer will be articulated uh, by, by Ken. Um, I, think, I think that's everything. I, I do want to do one last thing. I want to ask you a favor, if you would, please. These have been such wonderful talks, honestly. I think they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just marvelous. I cannot imagine our inaugural speaker for this series to have been better than Ken Myers. Uh, I would, I'd like to invite you to close us in this session with a word of prayer, if you would, please. Father, this is uh, a great opportunity to renew our commitment to the form that your salvation has taken and is taking. Uh, it's easy for us to slip into a form of dualism. Uh, it sometimes mimics what the world does. Uh, it's and sometimes it's a, an easy way out from all of the demands of embodied life uh, and uh, the, the challenges of, of faithful living in the body. Uh, it's also uh, hard to cultivate healthy imaginations in a world filled with uh, quick and ephemeral distractions. Uh, it's easy to fall prey to the temptation to uh, to see our ministry in terms of manipulating images rather than building strong uh, imaginations. I thank you for uh, the interest in addressing these questions in this institution and for the thousands of people who will be affected by the ministers who come uh, and teachers who come uh, through this uh, place. Pray that there will be many rich conversations and uh, and reading and perhaps even some arguments about uh, how to pursue this. Uh, this is an area that the church has not attended to as carefully as it must and it will take time for the recovery of wisdom and uh, courage that's necessary to be faithful this way. And we thank you for the gifts of uh, the richness of experience in your creation.
for the uh, delights that we have through the senses, which you intend us to delight in a way that honors you. I pray that we'll uh, learn to, to train our, uh, our use of our bodies well so that um, we don't just treat them as uh, disposable containers for our minds and spirits, but treat them as uh, the sacrifices that they are meant to be uh, to express the, our full following of you. Thank you again for uh, our time and pray that you'll continue to bless conversation over the coming days. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.